If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Garner, and welcome to Ask the Doctor. We are on our 11th season, and it's great to be back. As you know, this program was assisted to help you in understanding medical issues so you can take charge of your own health. It is more important than ever, especially in this media age, to become an informed patient. And we are here to bring you timely health discussions. Remember, always consult with your primary physician anything that you might take away from our discussion. Now for this episode, we're going to the streets of Brooklyn and Queens to find out what your questions are. If we didn't get to you, you can also visit our website at netny.net slash doctor. And here you can submit questions and opinions via our forum. Now for this episode, I have Dr. Margarita Kutsina, geriatric medicine and attending at New York Methodist Hospital. Next to her is Dr. Robert Seminara, breast disease surgeon from New York Methodist Hospital. And then we have Dr. Jeremiah Gellis, cardiology attending at New York Methodist Hospital. Welcome to all. And I'm really glad to have you here. Very different type of show than the live call-in show where we, we actually send Teresia and our team out to the streets to get interesting questions from people that are fans of the show and couldn't get through in the past by phone. We also have some email questions. So it'll be a little different. Don't come to your phone, but we're still going to have our regular segments. So for In the News, Coca-Cola. Interesting stories came out about cola in the last couple of weeks. Seems like drinking Coca-Cola for women, not for men, increased the risk of osteoporosis and broken bones significantly, and it was directly related to how much they drank. Whether it was Diet Coke, regular Coke, or Shasta Cola, whatever cola it is, there's something in the cola. And this didn't happen with Sprite or, any, or root beer, Dr. Brown, Dr. Pepper, none of, none of these. It may have to do with phosphoric acid, which is an acid that's in the soda. And when it gets into the blood, it seems to pull calcium out of the bones, out of the blood, so that the bones don't become as strong as they should. Again, this is for women only. It hasn't been proven in men. So for women who are out there drinking Diet Coke and thinking this is a good substitute for water, think again. It's not a good substitute. Water is probably the best. Um, any of the vitamin waters, regular water, milk. Milk is another good one. So again, keep this in mind. Fruit juice, even but you may want to stay away from excessive amount of Coke or Kohler. Okay, number two, fast stroke may prevent a stroke. We were talking about this before. By stroke, we're meaning swimming, by walking, walking upstairs. It seems like women who are doing at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week have about a 30% less chance of getting any type of stroke, <coughs> which is significant because we take pills to, to try and get this kind of percentage decrease. And here you could do something by just walking, something you don't need pills and something very easy to do. So anyway, that's what we have for in the news. Now, for our quiz, we, have to, we can't take phone calls, so what we'll do is you can send in your answer via the website to the, um, the opinion page, whatever, and give your answer there. And we'll take the first one that comes in under the email website, or you can send it in by regular mail, and we'll take the first answer that we open. But this is a tough one, so I don't know how many, how many are going to get this. It's an, it's an English word, and the letter I appears in it six times. What word is this? So it's a fairly common English word. The letter I appears six times. We need to get your answer. So you can submit your answer again via our website at www.netny.net. Or you can mail in your answer to the net at 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. We'll find out the winner next week when we have our next live show. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come back and meet the doctors, but let's take a short break now. And when we come back, we're going to go right to the videos and our email questions. Remember, the topics we're going to cover are general medicine, geriatric medicine, breast surgery, and cardiology. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Ask the Doctor, where our topics are general and geriatric medicine, breast surgery and cardiology, and now let's see who's our first uh, street person. Who do we got? Who do we have? 
I guess my question is, is there any, um, particularly with, with uh, I guess, cancer, is there any, um, is there any preventative measure that's, that's like the most important um, that, that they found out statistically? to help prevent uh, cancer? That's a good, que good question, Victor. I like it. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that out well. Is question. there a way to prevent cancer? And I think, I, Bob? Sure. Um, well, you know I like to discuss breast surgery and breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So the word cancer is so wide, so, so broad, and there are so many different cancers. But in a nutshell, the idea about cancer and malignancy is to be proactive about your health to know what's going on. For example, for breast. Uh, almost every woman in America has had a mammogram and or a sonogram by age 50 or 55. Those statistics exist practically 100% across the country. And now if every woman in America has had a mammogram by age 55 or 60, at least one, and the death rate for breast cancer in the United States still remains between 30, 35, and 40,000, it's just incredible that that fact is that mammogram is not enough. Now, mammogram and sonogram is absolutely important because, as we all know, it can detect carcinomas and things that perhaps we can't feel. But the idea about breast cancer is such that no woman should die of breast cancer in America. We've made strides with breast cancer in terms of the fact that women are living a lot longer with breast cancer. But when it comes to death rate, we haven't done as well as we can. So the idea is this, and perhaps we can extrapolate from this all other kinds of malignancies and avoid dying of these dreadly issues. First thing, for breast, every woman should consult a surgeon. It is my absolute opinion that unless even a physician... Any, even if you don't feel anything... Even if you feel nothing, just being a woman and having breasts is enough incidence. We have learned, as you know, and I'm sure our audience is... Uh, aware from my previous point or speaking that 75% of women who have malignancy have zero family history. So then what does that mean? That means everybody's at tremendous high risk. And I think healthcare and all of us practice the idea that we need to be proactive about our health and avoid things that can hurt us. And perhaps we need to pay more attention to those things that can hurt us and less, perhaps, to things that doesn't and just good common sense. I want sense. to come back to that. I'm sure. We'll leave it at that for now. A little cliffhanger sure. so we can um, do that. Now, before we get to the next question on the video, I have one on the email. It's actually from Jerry from Manhattan. It's with Dr. Katsina. What is the best way to reduce my cholesterol without using pills? And he tells us that his overall cholesterol is 220, which you can tell us about. HDL is 34. And the LDL is 149. What do these numbers mean? You know, the numbers itself um, carry uh, very little information, uh, except the HDL, which is a good cholesterol, is 34. It's uh, on the lower side. And the only way to increase that number would be regular exercise and eating a healthy diet, which is, uh, you know, low fat, a lot of fruits and, and vegetables. Uh, LDL is the bad cholesterol. And... Um, it depends, the uh, level that it should be at depends on your age, on, your, on the presence of a, a condition such as a high blood pressure, heart disease, strokes, uh, heart attacks, uh, and diabetes. And uh, again, if you would like to uh, go into the more details, you should uh, see your doctor, and your doctor will be able uh, to give you all the answers, uh, knowing your history. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Thanks a lot. And before again we go to the video, I want to, because we didn't even meet our doctors, we're going to get to meet them, but I have to ask Dr. Gellis, Mark from Staten Island wants to know, what's the difference between angioplasty and bypass surgery? Angioplasty is a percutaneous technique. That means that a catheter is inserted into the, an artery, threaded up to the blocked vessel, and the vessel is opened by a small balloon at the end of the catheter. It does not involve a major surgical incision, and it just involves a small entry uh, site where the catheter goes into the artery. A bypass operation involves a major surgical incision, 
uh, the extraction of veins to do the bypass with, the mobilization perhaps of an artery or more than one artery to do bypasses with, the connections of these vascular conduits or the bypass grafts to the aorta and to the artery that's blocked and it's in, so that it's a much more extensive operation. In a typical angioplasty, the patient would go home the next day. In bypass surgery, the patient would require several days in the hospital. Thank you. So now let's meet, um, a lot of these need no introduction. These guests are our, among our favorite guests on the show. They've been frequent mm -hmm. um, guests on the show. Dr. Katsina, what's, um, what's new and exciting in your uh, life? Anything in the last few uh, months? Uh, you know, I'm basically not really just still, um, I don't think anything is new and exciting. It's just still, it's all the same. It's nice. It's springtime, <laughs> right? The flowers are up. Have you been to the garden, Botanic Garden? Uh, not this year. Beautiful. Beautiful. The cherry blossoms in bloom. It makes you feel good this time of year, right? Absolutely. Is there something in the air? Is that truth? Do you get that little spring fever? Is that any medical basis for that? Uh, I'm not sure there should be, but uh, definitely it's well been proven that it's uh, that the sunlight definitely decreases the chances of uh, developing depression. And of course, we're all familiar with the fall depression or depression occurring in the winter time. So uh, spring, yeah. you know, the good uh, mood in the spring definitely has a lot of logical explanation. And that Sunday night depression. Remember that? We had the homework, sure. school, the weekend's over. I think, I'm, I wonder if you, after you retire, do you still get that Sunday night depression? I mean, I bet. I think so. I yeah, it's just bet. ingrained. Dr. Seminara, again, excellent breast surgeon, been with us many times. What's new? How's your daughter progressing in a medical school? Oh, my daughter and my family are doing very, very well. Uh, and we're enjoying springtime, just as you uh, alluded to, and we're all working very hard. And, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people out there are saying, you know, when are we going to have a miracle? You know, in my life I've never seen a miracle. Well, one needs only to go outside and see those uh, mm -hmm. trees start blossoming. And, and I think the sun and seeing a flower bloom is just a marvelous thing, and there's miracles outside every minute. I remember the first sign of spring yeah. as a kid. I don't know if you guys had that. The Gajuma man started coming around. Mm -hmm. Oh, Did what you did I miss? The Gajuma man with the truck, he's ringing the bells to sell ice cream. Yeah, he's, he's, the the Gajuma man. Mm -hmm. he's not around anymore, I think. Where is he? I, gotta get him. I think he I went up uh, sure. with the, with, I don't know, <laughs> in the area that we don't use anymore. I don't know. <laughs> and then the baseball cards. Oh, sure. Uh, we still have those. Though. Yeah. Getting a Mickey Mantle. Yep. And Dr. Geller, so what, um, you're smiling a lot. I know you were taking a nice walk tonight. What's, um, what's well, I see I was, your wife in the park all the time. Well, she walks a lot in the yeah. park, yes. And Maybe I was, you don't walk with her. I was actually, well, she gets up too early. I, okay. I, I, I don't get up that early <laughs> to walk. Uh, but I, no, I was actually trying to walk here today to enjoy the uh, sunshine after Beautiful. a day in the office working. But you guys uh, made me get here, so. I had to jump in a taxi. Well, we want the fast walk. <laughs> we want a fast stroke so you don't get a stroke, right? But also, you know, okay. it was interesting because usually you don't see the yellow cabs on 7th Avenue in Park Slope, but now they're there. Ooh. Economy. Yeah. Economy. Cool. So now let's get back. I know our team was out in the streets doing their best. Well, let's see what's the next question. Also about cancer. Actually, it sounds very similar. Let's hear what he has to say. All right, my father has cancer, and I want to know the best way for me and my seven brothers not to get cancer. He has cancer really bad, so I want to know the best way to prevent that. Okay, and this is Kofi Williams I know calling, not Victor. Victor was our first call. This is Kofi. So what would um, Dr. Gassan, what are you going to tell Kofi? about it? He's worried um, about his father. It depends uh, what kind of cancer his father has. Uh, for, but, so the answer is various based on the uh, kind of a cancer, which is important for... Um, for Willie, Willie, Willie is his name? Uh, Willie, Willie, Kofi, Kofi uh, Coffee, Williams. Kofi Williams, so what, um, so he has to know his family history uh, very well. Uh, particular attention should be paid to the preventive measures. For instance, somebody who has uh, colon cancer in the family, mm -hmm. it's very important to know what age the colon cancer was detected. So the family member uh, would be able to start screening colonoscopy 10 years prior to the age that uh, cancer that cancer was detected. Mm. Um, if his father has a prostate cancer, so definitely it's uh, you look. It's not that uh, you know. It's not that simple, and the approach to the testing for prostate cancer, prostate cancer is debatable uh, lately. But uh, I think what um, Kofi should know is um, see the doctor on a regular basis. Do uh, all age-appropriate <coughs> screening such as you know, women in the family should get the mammogram 
and colonoscopies and uh, gynecological exam appropriate to the age. Uh, the same applies to the men, such as prostate screening and uh, colonoscopy. Kofi, thanks. I think that's a good, um, good question and a good answer. Good answer. You know what I remember in the phone calls? Remember the numbers? Instead of having this 499, you'd have a name to it, which had a lot more class. I remember Cloverdale 6 or yes. Esplanade. What did you have? I remember Hickory. Hickory uh, 9 or yeah. whatever it was, Cloverdale, Espinard, yeah. and then when there's an NI also. Nightingale. I remember. Nightingale. There remember you any go. of these, Gedney? Nightingale. These were good names. Was, uh, I, grew a lot of fun. In, I grew up in Great Neck, and it was um, Great Neck, and then there were just two or three, there were, I think, three Great Neck, two, and then three digits. Because oh. it was a small town then. Yeah, it was a good part of growing up, those numbers. Now I think it takes a lot of the class out, just 273, 49. You had a little class before, and knowing you had a certain number. Sheep's had three. Yeah. yeah, I remember Sheep's had, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, I guess they've gone with illegal movie theaters, too. Right? Good humor, man. I think they the took good, the good humor when I grew with up, <laughs> When I grew up, you just picked up the phone and you got an operator. No. You didn't, yes. Well, I shouldn't you had say, Florence or something? How you going to think I'm very old? No, seriously. You picked up the phone and then you, Next an operator. Next week we're live. I hope our callers are going to... An operator appear. answered. Wow. And, and, and you gave her the number. Interesting. So remember, no phone calls tonight, but what we'll do is we'll take a break, and when we come back, we're going to get right to the uh, videos, because we have a lot of them to go. So we're going to talk about general medicine, breast disease, and cardiology. So we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to Ask the Doctor, where our topics are general medicine, geriatric medicine, breast surgery, and cardiology. And I have with me Dr. Margarita Kotsina, geriatric medicine attending. Then next to her is Dr. Robert Seminara, breast surgeon. And then we have Dr. Jeremiah Gellis, cardiology attending in New York Methodist Hospital. And now let's get right back to the videos where I hear that Mildred Lopez has a question that she wants us to get to. Mildred, what is it? Doc, my question is, if you have a fibrillator in your heart, how, how do you know when it has to be replaced with the battery, or do you get sick, or what's the changes, or what happens when it has to be changed? Because I know it says five years, but what about if it's less than five years and it really has to be changed? What do you do, or what happens? If you have a battery in a radio, you hear it start getting dead, but you don't want to hear your battery in your heart starting going dead, so how do we know? Well, if you have a defibrillator, a defibrillator is supposed to be checked every three months by the doctor who put it in or by an electrophysiologist. Uh, I hope that you're if you have a defibrillator, it is being checked. Uh, some of the companies manufacture defibrillators that can be checked over the internet, and the doctor monitoring your defibrillator can actually go on the internet and see what your defibrillator is doing. So it's very important if you have a defibrillator to get the battery checked and the defibrillator checked every three months. Eldridge, that's a good question. I'm sure a lot of people have that. Um, thanks a lot, and thanks for the answer, Dr. Gellis. Now let's go to Andy Brixey. Nice name. He's a 22-year-old. Andy, what's your question? And my question would be, what can I do as a 22-year-old to really prevent breast cancer? I like those shades, huh? Nice sunglasses there. Rob, what can she well, do? She's 22. <clears throat> what can she do? I think it's a great question. Thank you for your question. Uh, you know, a lot of people out there uh, think, well, I'm 22, I'm 23, uh, breast cancer is not something I have to worry about. Well, first of all, the scoop on that is as follows. When women get older, their risk of breast cancer increases, proportional to their age, without exception. So the younger a woman is, the less likely someone is to have breast cancer. However, when it does happen, although the incidence is much less, it is a much more severe disease. So, if it takes five years, and these are facts, for breast cancer to become one centimeter in size, mm. and you found that at age 25 or 30, that means it was there at age 24 or 25. Therefore, what you can do is it's imperative to know your body. Now, when it comes to examining the breast, almost every woman has told me over the years that I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to examine my breast. It's full of lumps, it's full of bumps. I don't know what to do. 
Well, there is no right way to examine your breast, and there is no wrong way to examine your breast. The issue is you should know your body. In your shower, you should know how your body feels. If you ever feel anything different, bring it to the attention in your do of your doctor. But being proactive means asking the questions to your doc, asking your doc if you can be examined by a breast surgeon if you have questions. And even to get back to the other question we had that the gentleman asked us about breast cancer, it's imperative to remember that while all of this moribund attitude about cancer that exists and, and creates fear in the hearts of all people, one needs to remember that almost every malignancy is curable if found in time. So be proactive and get there early. Every time a woman dies of breast cancer, it's because the surgeons got there too late. So let's get there on time and be proactive about our health, and that's the message. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good answer. Let's go now to Noel Suarez. Noel, I don't know how old Noel is, but he wants to know from Dr. Katsina about cheaper alternatives to nicotine gum. Did I sell that right, Noel? What, what, how do you say it? How you doing? My name is Noel. I'm from Ridgewood, Queens, and I want to know, I'm a smoker, I want to know what kind of medicine is being created nowadays to, uh, you know, get people off of smoking cigarettes that is cheaper than the gum, because I find that uh, the, the gum is a lot more expensive than the cigarettes, and um, I just wanted to know what kind of advances in medicine uh, is being done so it could be a lot more feasible and more uh, easier to get off of cigarettes. Mm. Thank you. Dr. Casino, what do you recommend? Okay, so this is, a, you know, this is a great question. Great and there question. is a, right. And there is a, unfortunately, there are a lot of young people who continue to smoke and more teenagers that begin smoking. Uh, however, what I'm actually noticed is that there is more and more people become aware of the necessity to stop smoking. Uh, which is the most important decision the person is to make is uh, to decide to stop smoking. And this is the best medicine, so to speak, for the person because he has to be or she has to be absolutely convinced that this is a decision that has to be made and uh, um, stay off the smoking. To help, there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of different medications or a lot of uh, different substances. You know, one is the nicotine substitution, such as uh, uh, nicotine patches, uh, different inhalers, which a lot of smokers, at least from my practice, found um, the most helpful. So there is a, it's a nicotine inhalers that, um, that people inhale and use instead of a cigarette. So that's, uh, um, it, becomes, it becomes a routine. So instead of lighting a cigarette, the person uh, takes the inhaler and smokes. So this is, uh, um, and it's a very good way to uh, help to stop smoking. Um, in addition to the nicotine substitution subjects, there is, uh, there is certain medication. Uh, one of it is uh, uh, antidepressant, which is called Wellbutrin. But again, you'll definitely have to speak to your doctor before taking any medication. And your doctor will be able to decide whether its medication is appropriate for you to make sure that you have no, uh, no contraindications. Uh, there is another pill that is, exists. I just slipped the name. Chantix. Chantix. Yeah, Chantix. Chantix, which also um, has been found to be effective. However, uh, there are some reports coming in lately that that medication is associated with an increased risk of suicide. So, so again, before taking any medications, please speak to your doctor. I have a question yes. for Margarita. Do the insurance yes. carriers pay for this nicotine spray and for the other medications? Do all or the, most of the major insurance carriers pay for this? Because you know, that's what he was asking. You know, us. I. I I know that insurance company, the companies definitely pay for uh, antidepressant and Chantix. Medicaid pays for uh, nicotine substitute. They pay for inhalers. Mm -hmm. But there is also, um, if, you di if you dial 311, mm -hmm. and there is a, um, way, you right? can ask them. Yeah, yeah, 311, it's, uh, I think it's the well, operator will transfer you. Right, will transfer you to the appropriate department. Right. Because I think city nowadays sponsors uh, the program. So 311 is a good number to call. Right. Yeah. Dr. Garner. Very good. It's a good number. If you're playing the numbers as well, it might be a good number to play now. 311. Right. So I think they may have to go play it now. Before we get to um, next call, next video, Ralph wants to know, he's 67 years old, how he can tell the difference between chest pain that's related to the heart and the chest pain related to heartburn. It's very difficult to tell the difference between heartburn and chest pain that's related to the heart. 
the esophagus, the food tube, passes right down behind the heart. And very frequently, uh, esophageal pain will, be, will feel exactly like heart pain. And that's why it's called heartburn. And the only real way to make the distinction is see a doctor and let the doctor do the appropriate historical examination and the appropriate testing. And that will hopefully make the difference. Thank you. We're now going to go back to the streets, to Eleanor Handley. She's a young person who has a good question. Eleanor, what's your question? And I guess my question would be, as a youngish person, relatively healthy, who avoids going to the doctor as much as possible, how bad is that and how often should I be going and getting checked out? Interesting. You tell that, that Bensonhurst accent. Did you hear yeah. that? Yeah, I, I heard that. detected that accent. Very nice accent, Eleanor. The question is, and I, I don't know if Dr. Marguerite Katsina wants to jump in. She's, you see she's a relatively young person. Mm -hmm. Why should she go to the doctor or should she go for annual exams? Uh, it's, I think it's a part of that uh, doctor seminar answer mm -hmm. because a lot of uh, serious medical conditions in the beginning and the initial stages uh, have no symptoms. So this is the purpose of uh, uh, annual physical examination. Because uh, uh, usually during part of the physical exam, so-called well exam, would be uh, to examine the lymph nodes, um, examine any evidence of a skin cancer, you know, as, a, um, as I mentioned, lymph nodes, breast exam, if depending on the age is the uh, rectal examination. So during that simple uh, physical uh, examination, sometimes the doctor is able to find something that actually uh, that is worrisome. Um, blood work, routine blood work is very important because during the blood work, uh, the blood test will be able to detect, for instance, anemias or any abnormalities in the blood count high cholesterol or thyroid problem. So that's, uh, you know, this is the purpose of uh, general physical examination. And, uh, you know, insurance companies, almost all insurance companies pay for the preventative uh, examination. Okay. Sure. okay, we have a question for Dr. Seminara. Eleanor, Staten Island says one breast is bigger than the other. Is this unusual? Very, very common, Eleanor. Um, if the disparity between your breasts is very large, um, and it's a problem for you in clothing or bathing suits, definitely you should see uh, your breast surgeon or ask your doctor to refer you to a surgeon who primarily operates on the breast and have this discussion. Sometimes it can be the sign of underlying cystic disease or a lump in the breast too. But it's very common, most of the time, breasts are not perfectly the same size. If the asymmetry, that's the word we use to describe one is larger than the other, is great, however, or getting bigger, definitely seek consultation. Thank you. Not just for medical, but for you yourself. Okay, moving right along back to the streets, as we say, <laughs> Jeremy Gaddy has a good question. Jeremy, what's your question tonight? Uh, at what age should I check or be concerned for prostate cancer? Hmm. Prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Who wants to you grab know, it? You can, you know, it's a def um, Sure. So if a person has no symptoms, the screening usually begins at age 50, at age 50. However, uh, lately there is more and more studies that um, prove that uh, even screening for prostate cancer is, uh, is debatable. There are pluses and minuses. And uh, generally the approach is before when you see your doctor and uh, you should ask your doctor a question, should you be screened for the prostate cancer? Because uh, some of prostate cancer, some types of prostate cancer, are very aggressive and need an immediate intervention and extensive treatment, uh, followed by a lot of uh, different side effects that sometimes may be more debilitating than prostate cancer itself. Uh, some types of uh, prostate cancer are very, very, very slow growing. And uh, for instance, in found, is if found in an older person, you know, the diagnosis and testing and uh, uh, treatment, again, have a lot of uh, side effects and definitely um, worsen the quality of life and sometimes even shorten the patient's life. So again, when you see a doctor, you have to ask a doctor whether you should be screened for the prostate cancer and discuss all the risks and benefits. But overall, the recommendation is uh, at a PSA test, which is a special uh, blood test, is done at the age 15. However, 
If you feel any symptoms such as uh, you know, difficulties urinating or maybe the weak stream or urination at night or anything, any symptoms that concern you, you should definitely see your doctor and speak to your doctor. We're now going to go back to the streets for a double question actually from Lee Seymour. And her first question has to do with a hip replacement that uh, she just had. Lee, what's that first one? And my question for the doctor is this. I'm going to turn 60 next year, and I'm hoping to go skydiving. I'm hoping to go skydiving, and I had my right hip replaced. And I'm wondering if I could skydive with my fake hip. That's what I really want the doctor to tell me. All right, so let's listen to what the doctor has to say. Who? Dr. Gellis, do you have any relation to this question? Well, I just had a right hip replaced. <laughs> <laughs> and if I was interested in skydiving, which I'm not, but if I were, I would ask the orthopedist who did the hip replacement if it's all right to skydive. So, okay. Doctor. And I'd like to say that, you know, the purpose of surgery is to make you better. And if you want to skydive, go for it. But speak to the orthopedic surgeon. And the idea behind all of this is to make you better and well enough to go skydiving. But be sure you speak to him or her and find out if it's okay for you to do. Or get a big pillow maybe you could land on or something <laughs> like that. But Lee, next week we'll have an orthopedist. Maybe we'll see. We do have an orthopedist with us next week. That'd so. be great. Well, you can call back. But I know you want to get a second question in. So, all right, let's hear it quickly. What's the second question? I have contracted a disease called TTP, and I'm having marks on my arm. And I'm wondering if it's related to the TTP. Hmm. The TTP put me in a coma for five months and put me in a stroke. So I'm having this red marks on my arm. Can hmm. you tell me if it's related to the TTP? It's a tough, mm -hmm. tough yeah, one. You know, she's got uh, a yeah, lot, but she's going to go mm -hmm. skydiving. Right, what do you, right. What's the TTP? It's, uh, um, TTP is an extremely, it's a very, very serious disease that potentially can be fatal. And you actually, from the way you appear, you appear to be in a very good state. Um, it's hard to tell by looking at it from, uh, you know, and the, from the recording what, there, what kind of marks that is. But sometimes that condition that you have can cause some time of a, a, like, a, like a petechia or area like the, with the broken vessels. It's hard, again, it's hard for me to tell by looking at it from the screen whether it's related. And unfortunately, because it's, uh, the question is recorded, I, can ask, uh, I cannot uh, ask you, you know, certain questions. But again, the uh, answer is that it is, it is possible. But please see not only your doctor. This is a kind of a condition that should be managed by the specialist, which is called hematologist. So please, speak, uh, please see your hematologist. Any other? Yeah, I would just agree yeah. and say that the answer is yes. That rash could be related to it. Go to the hematologist mm -hmm. and get some answers, especially if you're going to think about going skydiving. I'm just Let's find uh, out what's going on. This is a very good photographer, Great. very aggressive. Our next question is on hemorrhoids. I just hope he wasn't as aggressive. <laughs> so uh, but, uh, let's see what our next question has to do from Ruby. Ruby Williams. Ruby, what do you have to say? You have a question about your mom. And my question is, my mother is I'm currently on dialysis, and I wanted to know the best way to prevent kidney failure because it runs in my family. Kidney failure, which is becoming more and more prevalent in this country as we see diabetes Absolutely. and high blood pressure on the rise. I, uh, I, I, I think I mean, it goes back to, go back to the, the line, beginning right? again, similar, sure. to, similar to our answers about preventive medicine. How do you prevent renal failure? Mm. You know, the answer, yeah, I mean, there is no simple answer to that because uh, kidney disease so severe that requires dialysis can be caused by multiple conditions, beginning of something that um, congenital conditions or something that occur because of the diabetes, high blood pressure, and all that, you know, in a variety of other, uh, other medical conditions. Um, if, for instance, uh, um, kidney disease run in your family, so it's definitely uh, you'll have to find out more, um, you know, more precisely who exactly, who is sick with the kidney disease. Again, see your doctor. Maybe you'll require the, the kidney sonogram to detect the congenital condition or kid congenital disease of the kidneys. If you have diabetes, make or your family member have diabetes, make sure that the diabetes is uh, well controlled and uh, you know, you're seeing your doctor frequently for follow-up visits, you're compliant with the medications. If you have di uh, high blood pressure, so the, di uh, the blood pressure should be very well controlled and it does decrease the chances of developing kidney failure requiring dialysis. 
So I hope that helps you, Ruby. And um, let's move on now to Anne Cassatomart, who has another kidney question. Anne, what's your question, Anna? Um, I want to ask him to the doctor, see the, the people who donate one kidney have any problem. Oh, so do you need two kidneys to live or can you live just as well with one kidney and give one to someone else who needs it? Today, so much doning uh, is being done and so much great, great progress has been made with kidney transplants um, that the answer is you can do perfectly well with one kidney. And that's one reason why the donation program is working out so terribly well. Um, but to, just to get back to your comment, Dr. Garner, I'm very impressed with how kidney disease is on the rise. It's amazing how many patients really have compromised problems with their kidneys. So as, uh, you know, Dr. Margarita told you before, s blood tests periodically from the other caller can show subtle changes in the kidney, which could then have her doctor readjust the medications to prolong the life of these compromised kidneys. So it's another reason why going to, for those blood tests and seeing your doctor is so important. Right, starting early, catching it early, whether it's a cancer, whether it's renal failure, that's the key to success sure. in treating it. Gee, we're great people walking down the street. Great These are questions. just people that walked up and um, you give them a $10, they ask a question. Okay. $10? I'm going to go on the street. Fran, Fran Savalas. And um, she has a question actually for Dr. Seminara. Fran, let, let's hear it. I, I'd like to know why they don't do a sonogram before the mammogram because normally when you do a mammogram, they send you for a sonogram because it's more diagnostic and, you know, it would nip it in the bud much easier, you know, than going through, because the mammogram doesn't pick up a lot. You know, normally I always have to go for a sonogram afterwards, so I think that would be a better way to go, sonogram first, and then the mammogram. You know, and that's you. my opinion. Again, nice sunglasses. Yeah, great, great sunglasses. Great sunglasses. Yeah. Why would you want to go for a sonogram or a mammogram first or ask our breast surgeon? You know, Dr. Gardner, uh, the questions really tonight are terrific. It's just the way it is. Um, that ten dollars a question no, is really a working smart out. Group, yeah. It's a very smart group. But uh, to answer Fran's question, I'm going to tell you today that I happen to agree with you. However, I'm also going to tell you that this question is very, very controversial. The idea is this: I agree with you. I think the more tests you go, especially if they are harmless tests like sonogram, are quite all right to do because the sonogram may pick up things the mammogram won't. However, it's important to know for our audience mm -hmm. that the mammogram tests a certain type of thing that the sonogram does not. The mammogram is looking for subtle calcifications or little sprinkly white spots on the x-ray for our patients to understand that the sonogram can't pick up. The sonogram, on the other hand, is checking the difference between densities, between hardness, solidness, and liquid and air. That's the way the two things work. So complementing them is good. However, I'm going to tell you that there's many radiologists, and you yourself uh, might have a very variant mm -hmm. opinion because of the fact that some people think sonograms are a waste of time, radiologists, and that they uncover too many things that we didn't need to know. But my answer is if we save one life and it's a test that can't hurt us, we should do it. So complementing these tests, in my opinion, are good, but people have varying opinions. However, you're the patient. Be proactive, ask your doctor, discuss it, know about BIRADS rating, know about the fact that mammograms and sonograms are rated from one to five, as I've spoken on a previous program, and ask your doc, you know, you told me, Dr. Uh, Smith, that my mammogram or sonogram was normal. What was my BIRADS rating? Could you tell me, please? Mm -hmm. Because it's imperative for women to know, and I want patients to be proactive, because we don't want another woman to die of breast cancer, Thank period. You. Now let's go to Ronnie from Manhattan, actually, and she has a question uh, from our email supply for Dr. Gellis. Is there, a is there a connection between high blood pressure and stress? In other words, you work on a stressful job, can that give you high blood pressure? I believe that stress can definitely contribute to hypertension, and hypertension is a really multifactorial disease. Uh, there are many things that contribute to it. We call it essential hypertension because fundamentally we don't know any single cause for it. But stress will definitely uh, increase your blood pressure. And if you can, you should try to avoid it. But it's very yeah, difficult. Dr. Casino, what do you think about stress and illness in general? Um, I mean, it's a well-known fact that stress, being stressed 
for a long time, for a prolonged period of time in particular, can um, weaken the immune system, which definitely can give rise for, to all, this, the, all different conditions. So that's why it is important to exercise, which decreases the level of stress. Exercise, do yoga, eat right, and try to spend time on uh, you know, other activities. You, know, you can spend time with your family, your friends, and uh, so, so distress, so to speak. Mm. So Maddie has a question. Let's just do a few of these because I, I'll give our street people a chance to relax for a few minutes. <laughs> Maddie takes Benadryl for, my hay, for hay fever, but it makes me so tired. What else can I take? So she's taking Benadryl, which works, but it's making her very tired. Mm -hmm. You know, Benadryl overall is not a great medication, particularly, again, it's very important how old Maddie is. For somebody who is above 65, Benadryl is absolutely contraindicated because it can cause a lot of confusion, it can cause a retention of the urine, so this person is not able to urinate, which uh, at the end can actually cause the rupture of the uh, bladder. But, um, so instead of uh, Benadryl, there are some other medications such as uh, Claritin, that lack that um, sedating effect. Claritin, Allegra, some people, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a good idea again, see maybe the ENC doctor or allergologist and get tested and uh, because sometimes um, what, they, uh, what the specialists offer is the special injections that decreases your level of allergy and at the end you may be able to get rid of the medication. Thank you. We got Hilda who's troubled with large breasts. It's giving her back aches. It's causing all kinds of problems. She's embarrassed. She wants to have breast reduction. She wants to know are there any problems with breast reduction that she should know. Breast reduction <clears throat> is a good way to alleviate all of these problems, both psychologically, socially, as well as the pain that it might give to the girdle of the shoulder. And uh, as, as people sometimes become more osteoporotic too and the posture changes, and they get different shapes in the back, like a kyphosis. Uh, it'll only exacerbate that and give you more pain. And the idea be behind good health um, has to do with living a, a normal, healthy life and being happy and de-stressing. And it's hard if you're in pain every day. Um, to do a reduction surgery for the breasts, we call it reduction mammoplasty, is a relatively safe operation. However, it's a surgery that takes several hours to do. You want to discuss all the options with your doctors. It is a procedure that is completely paid for. Insurance companies should pay in full for that surgery. So don't think out there that if you're planning a surgery like this that it would be very expensive for cosmetic reasons and something you cannot afford. Uh, and uh, I wish you good luck with that. Then we're going to go back to the street for the next question. Um, I've got Richie Cass out there who has a question for Dr. Gellis. Rich? My doctor told me I have a heart murmur, but I shouldn't worry about it. So my question is, what's a heart murmur? Got Richie up against the wall over there. All right. What's a heart murmur? <clears throat> a heart murmur basically means that you can hear the blood circulating through the heart, in particular going through one or another of the valves in the heart. There are four valves in the heart. Now, the question of whether you hear it or not may or may not mean that it's significant. So generally speaking, if a doctor hears a heart murmur, he or she will order an echocardiogram or an ultrasound examination of the heart. And that will enable the physician to determine whether the murmur is significant. Significant means that it in some way is causing the heart to work harder, to s deliver the necessary amount of blood to your body. Without knowing what kind of murmur you had or where, what valve it was coming from, it's very hard for me to say more than that, but you should definitely ask the doctor who told you you had a heart murmur which valve it's coming from and how significant it is. And if it's not significant, why isn't it significant? Many times we do hear the blood going through the v a valve and the valve is completely normal and it isn't, in fact, significant but you really have to question the doctor closely about it. Rich, thanks for the question. You, um, we're now going to go to someone who has a problem that I think most women would, would love to have if they had to worry about it, Yair Banks. I never heard that name, Yair, Y-A-E-I-R, very nice name. How do, you, um, how do you gain weight? 
What type of protein drinks? Yeah, there wants to gain weight. Let's see what you're at. You're where? Let's hear, what, let's hear from you. My mouth. question is, as a young man, because I work out a lot, how do you gain weight? Like, you know, what do you do to gain weight? What type of protein drinks or, you know? Yeah, no, it's a... How do you gain weight? He probably wants to put on some muscles, maybe. Uh... Yeah, Dr. Garner, I uh, coach the New York Methodist basketball team, too. How'd we do? Uh, oh, we did very, very well. <laughs> we did very good in basketball city, yeah. and we won several championships. We're not doing it now, but I hope to get started again. Uh -huh. But you have no idea how many players came to me and said, I'm going to the gym, I'm working out just like your caller, and I just can't gain mm. weight. So I had an idea for them, and it worked every time. The idea is this. Gaining weight and losing weight is very hard to do, but very simple to understand. If you consume more calories than you burn up that day, you're gaining weight that day. It's just that simple. haagen a little ice cream at night, put it in the that's microwave. The that's the answer. Have a pint every night and you'll love it, you'll feel good, and I promise you. So that's the answer you to You're going to gain weight. We have the answer to happiness, to gaining weight. Yeah, haagen sure chocolate do. chocolate chip. Chocolate chip. Think, Enjoy you know, it. Probably this gentleman is interested in bulking up. Yeah, well, right? I, yeah, we're not I mean, going to go there. That's he why. wants to bulk up, and so I would this. say the most important thing is don't let anybody That's give right. you drugs. Right. That's it. Okay? Good answer. Good Just answer. work out in the gym. Stay with the ice cream. Get a good trainer, yeah. and whatever your body does, it will do. I wonder if um, women have more of that. Do you notice in your pa practice that women... Um, have the hardest time uh, you know, with the weight? I, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I cannot recall any single person, any single woman, woman asking me how to gain weight. Yes. There is a, almost everyone has a question how to lose weight, regardless of their body some weight, regardless of yeah, their body weight. Sure. Some cultures but, um, value the, right. the overweight. Some cultures like that. It's, look, you know, it's amazing. Our culture decided skinny is the best and other cultures decided being obese is the best. It's interesting. Yeah, but I think Absolutely. it's as long as you're healthy and you feel good, this is the weight you should be at. So I mean, unless, again, if you are not, you know, morbidly obese. But overall, again, if you're healthy, the weight is, uh, again, again, you can always discuss it with your doctor. What is your ideal body weight? But you feel good and you're healthy and uh, just stay this way. So look, along this line, I have two questions from Eleanor. Mm -hmm. And she says, do you think I should take a multiple vitamin, multiple everyday vitamin? I'm 70 year old female and in good condition. And then she throws in, a, she sneaks in a second question here. She says, I'm four feet, five feet four, I weigh 160 pounds. What's the best way for me to lose weight? So we get from one, in, one extreme mm -hmm. to the other. What about the multiple vitamin? Does uh, everyone have to take that? Uh, you know, generally if you eat normally, if you eat well-balanced diet with the, food, with the fruits and vegetables, uh, you're not supposed to, there is no need to take multivitamins. And so far, there are multiple studies that have been done but uh, none of the multivitamins, except for few, have been found to be uh, beneficial. The only exception is uh, uh, vitamin D, which has been proven to decrease uh, osteoporosis, which is a weakening of the bones. It decreases the falls in the elderly, and overall it, it, it decreases the uh, mortality. Mortality is the you know, rate of people die, or rate of death. So it's a great vitamin, and if you're above 65, you should definitely take um, vitamin D, and your doctor will be able to tell you the dose, the appropriate dose of the vitamins. Eleanor, before we get to the next question, let's, let's see Ann on our street person, Ann Edwards. And what's your question? Relate to this topic? Hi, doctor. My name is Ann Edwards, and I would like to know about uh, losing weight healthy. And uh, my weight is 198, and I would like to come down to 150. Mm. And I would like to, you know, a suggestion from you. Yeah, she looks and losing some of this wearing weight. Wearing the weight very well. You can't tell. 198. She wants mm -hmm. to come down to 150. I saw the sun in the background right. nodding his head. How does she lose? You know, it? I think Dr. Uh, Seminara just right. gave us the idea. So right. again, you have to definitely know how much, you know, how much calories you consume, and uh, during your daily activities by, uh, you know, limiting or moderating your uh, meals and uh, exercising you should make sure that you spend more energy that you uh, get in. So again, the most healthiest way to lose weight is the uh, exercise and balanced diet. And thanks for that question. Do what Dr. Kutsina says and you're gonna lose it in a healthy way. We're gonna go to Louie now. Louie's um, our last street person of the night. Louie, they came up to you, put the microphone in your face, and what did you say? I'm gonna cut down my cholesterol. 
no medication and, and take care of yourself, you know. And do um, do some exercise. And eat your food healthy. The man a few words, but he gets right to the point. He wants to cut down his cholesterol. Probably the best way to control your cholesterol is with, as Dr. Katsina has indicated before, is diet and exercise. However, depending on what your cholesterol is and what other conditions you may have, whether you have diabetes, hypertension, or any heart disease, or any vascular disease at all, one, you may have to reduce your cholesterol in a more aggressive way. And it's frankly very difficult to do that by diet alone, especially in the United States where there's tempting food in, in your face all the time. So if that would have to be a decision that your doctor would have to make with you. And if the doctor feels that in order to get your cholesterol to where it needs to be, you're going to probably need medication, then you will have to take medication. But start with diet and exercise. Okay, we're going we're to go to some of our email questions in the remaining minutes. You, you just took a test recently and passed the new, the new boards, right? It was, it was uh, not that real, but relatively, real, relatively recently. Yeah, what was, what was the name of that board? Uh, it's, a, it's a hospice and palliative care. It was a big topic, you know, as we get older and baby boomers. Um, how do you deal with people that are terminally ill, make them comfortable in their... Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a great area, and it's unfortunate sometimes. It's, a, you know, very sad and very difficult and very stressful for the family, for the patient, uh, you know, patient's family. But it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great area that um, can help a lot and make the patient and the family member more comfortable. Okay, let me get to the next question. Frankie, Frankie at the, um, on our email wants to know, he gets frequent nosebleeds. Is that dangerous? Uh, this is, you know, it's a very, um, it's a general question again. It's, uh, there is no simple answer to that. It, it depends how bad, it, how severe the bleeding is and what is the cause of it. Sometimes the answer can be, you know, it, the cause of it is as simple as a simple upper respiratory tract infection. But the person can have, you know, high blood pressure, um, blood problems, blood disease, and some maybe ulcers or some even malignancies in the nose. Again, if your nose bleeds are recurrent, you should definitely see your doctor. Very good. I got a, one last question from Doris to come in. Let's see. Doris wants to know she's been diagnosed with a cyst in the breast. She wants to know if a cyst can ever turn cancerous. Uh, the answer to the question is no. A cyst is not going to turn cancerous, and an elephant's not going to become a giraffe, hmm. and an aardvark is not going to become a thoroughbred racehorse. However, in medicine, there's always that word however, and however, the cyst in your breast may be an example of the fact that your breasts are producing stuff. And any time an organ is producing things, one has to have a serious look at that organ to make sure that someday it's not going to produce something other than a cyst and a tumor. So it may be an example or exemplary of an organ that wants to produce something in the future and therefore needs to be watched. Thank you. We really had our media exhausted. We had computers, we have typing, we have video. And I, I have to ask the quiz again because I know a lot of people are going to have a trouble with this one, but not our audience. Can. The letter I appears six times in this English word. What word is it? Letter I six times in this English word. What is it? You can submit your answers via our website at www.netsny.net. Also, mail in your answers to, net, to the net at 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. We'll find out who the winner is next week. Remember, the first email in and the first letter that we open up is going to get it. And I know this, this went very quickly. I want to thank you all for watching this edition. And I'd like to thank Dr. Margarita Kutsina, Dr. Robert Seminara, and Dr. Jeremiah Gellis for coming in. We hope we were able to help you. Remember, it's good to be proactive about your health. Speak to your doctors about your concerns. Just as Dr. Kutsina just told you, always talk to your doctor about what we say. Go for second opinions. Go for third opinions. In the meantime, continue to watch NET and visit the website at netny.net slash doctor. Here you can check out quizzes, submit your thoughts on the forum, or just watch past episodes. For those who like to tweet, follow us at twitter.com at netnewyork. I want to thank you all for the video questions. That was great. I want to thank Teresia and the crew for going out there, walking the streets, getting the answers. 
it's not easy. It's not easy. And we had great questions. A lot of Ask the Doctor fans out there. So next week, we're going to go back to our regular format where we'll have a live call-in show. So you want to get dialing now. I know Joel, Maddie, each one likes to get in first. And that's a good time to start. And I want to hear from you. So I want you to stay well, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the tablet.